We're live, we're live, we're live. What's up, guys? This is Keith Kelfis with the Untrapped Podcast on Apple, Spotify, YouTube, Facebook. We have Dan Plata, the home service CFO, here to talk about how to finally hire employees, how to turn applicants into employees, how to qualify them. He's going to take over in a little bit. It's going to be epic. Whenever Dan is on the show, he drops golden nut, nugget knowledge bombs. He was just here. <sighs> Sorry, I do my 20 push-ups. Every single time we're doing 100 push-ups oh, a day oh. for 30 days. You're doing it too. You already did yours today, right? I I, I had to do extra ones today because Marty <laughs> and I were doing like a workout over lunch and there were push-ups involved in that. And I was already at 80 and I ended up at 140. I was like, man, I just feel like, <laughs> but, but I still feel like I still feel like I still got to do 100 tomorrow because it doesn't matter if you did more than 100 today. I'm still, I'm still on the clock for 100 tomorrow. So we'll see. We'll see how whiny I get tomorrow doing those push-ups. Oh, bro. Yeah, dude, the other night I fell asleep at 80 push-ups. I was exhausted. And I woke up at 3.30 in the morning. I go, oh, my God. And I dropped down and I did the, my last 20 at 3.30 a.m. And I went. <laughs> it's a funny little obligation we gave ourselves. I like it, though. I like it. I'm excited, man. Uh, we welcome any of your comments that are coming in. But I'm going to let Dan um, take the floor. He came to my studio a few weeks ago and just crushed it. These podcast videos will be coming out soon. They're very nicely filmed in 4K, great audio quality, and it's like full courses, the lessons that Dan teaches. And also, if you go on my YouTube channel and you, t channel and you type in Keith Kalfas and Dan Plata, the four steps, you will get your mind blown. What, are pe what people are saying in the comments, it's I just, I'm just i very thankful to have you here on my show. So what's up, Dan? Dude, I'm, just, I'm glad to be here. I'm a little bit bummed that we didn't have time to do this when we got together because I... I ranted on the purgatories of scaling for like six hours. So we just ran out of time. Uh, we intended on doing this one together. There's just not enough hours in a day. Cause uh, uh, just cause I like to talk a lot. Let's be honest. I'm a, I'm a yapper. Uh, but, but what I really want to talk about, and this is a, this is a problem that so many home service business owners have trying to grow their business. And yeah, there's purgatories of scaling and there's sticky spots and there's ways to get through it. But if we can't figure out how to hire employees, it doesn't really matter because we can't grow a business with just us. It is not possible. And if you grow a business with shitty employees, which many of us have done, myself included, that sucks. I would rather just be doing it by myself. When you have a business full of crappy employees, like your world's not better because you're doing more. Your world is like multiplied with more shitty problems. And so getting the hiring process right to grow your business is really like the baseline thing that we've got to get right as business owners. And it's not easy. But there are some things we can do to make it a lot easier. And so I want to spend this episode talking about some just some things that we've gotten wrong enough times that we figured out how to do it right now. And I also so I've got best damn bookkeeping, my new bookkeeping business, but I'm also partnered in Hire Lead Chill, which is a recruiting company. And we're not we're not the um, technology platform company. We're the people that actually do the the job posting and do the filtering and do the outreach and, and connect the candidate to the business owner to get that person hired. We're not the platform. We're not the technology in the background. We're the boots on the ground connecting good candidates with good business owners to get people hired. Um, so that's where our expertise comes in. And as part of that, we've also built some, some skill sets in interviewing that I have found super interesting over the years um, and ways that we have just turned this shitty interview process where we hired crappy people and we probably don't get the people we actually want into a process where pretty much when we interview people, we can tell if they're good. And if they're good, we usually get them. We don't interview somebody. This is a problem I always had when, when I used to be running our day-to-day -day operations and like our window cleaning and maid service businesses, I would interview people and I'd be like, man, this dude's a stud. Like I got to get this guy. And he would, he would usually confirm for me that he would have been a great employee because he would be the one that would actually call me to tell me he took a different job. And I'd be like, shit, like that was the guy I needed. And then I didn't get him, but then I would hire the next jackass that came through and I'd have a shitty employee that I had to fire in two weeks type of thing. Um, so I've, I've lived that. I've you know made that mistake dozens of times. Um, but again, we can't scale this business and can't grow this business and can't do it in a way that we enjoy it if we don't have great employees. So before I get into the interviewing process and some of the filtering stuff that we found to be useful, I want to step back to the things where I see people going wrong right from the start. 
myself included, right? I don't, this isn't like a blame thing. This is just a trap that we get put in as business owners because of the frustration of this hiring process. And we see it all over social media, right? All the, nobody wants to work anymore. No, nobody wants to, nobody will show up every day. Everybody's showing up late. Everybody's no showing, right? It's like, we have this like total no show society and like lack of communication going on. And I'm not saying that those things are totally wrong, but what I would like to point out is I know plenty of damn business owners that are crushing it. And I'm pretty sure that if they're crushing it, they must have a really good team. So somebody's figuring out how to hire these people and maybe they ain't going to tell you how they're doing it, but I am. So sorry, people that are crushing it. Now I'm going to help everybody else crush it too. Um, but typically, and I see this in our recruiting business too. Typically, when somebody's having trouble hiring people, there's one place they need to look. The fucking mirror. Just like just go start there. Cause if you <laughs> if you can't hire people or if you can't keep people, it's you. It's your <laughs> job to create and like that's shitty, right? But but if you're mad that I just said that. You also kind of know that it's true. And I've been there. I've had trouble finding the right people or keeping the right people because I didn't create a job that they wanted. At one point in time, we had 10 different businesses when I was running Blue Skies. Would you want to work for me? I was everywhere and nowhere all at the same time. I couldn't give anybody any attention, right? Am I a good dude? I think so. Do I mean the best for everybody? Hell yeah. Do I want my employees to have a great job? You bet. Was I able to do that for them? No, I was in 10 different places at once. I was so distracted. What would I want to work for me? No, I'd have been miserable to work for. Did I lose employees left and right? Yep. Our turnover was horrendous. And I, and I kept like, I knew it was me, right? There's nowhere else to look, but it takes a long time to look in that mirror and like, be like, okay, I'm the problem. Let me figure out me. So that's usually the first place we need to start is it's just a, it's a us and it's a mindset thing. Cause the minute we start making excuses, that nobody wants to work anymore. We're going to treat everybody that comes in our door like they're there, that they're going to be around for like two minutes. And if we treat them like that, guess what? They're going to be around for two minutes. We, we had an office. Um, it wasn't me. It was Sean day. Who, Guys, uh, can you do me a favor real quick? Anybody listen here, share this, share this to your feed, share this into groups. Can you just do it right now in this moment? It'll take you 10 seconds. I never asked this, but this is so good. I actually want this message to, to, to permeate and get to the right people. If you have it in your heart to take 10, 15 seconds, just share this right now, share it, share it into groups. I want the people have, I, I don't hear people saying what Dan is saying right now. Let me know you shared it, put it in the comments. Drop all right, it. keep going. So, it, it, I mean, it all starts with us and we got to create a job that people want, right? And we got to be a leader that people want to work for and people want to follow. Um, they will come for the money but they won't stay for the money, right? They stay for us and for the culture and they will stay even when they could go get more money elsewhere. Right? So there's a few, uh, just core things that we need to do to create this atmosphere where we have people that want to come and work for us. One is it's all about, you know, our core values and our culture and, and getting people to follow you and, and believe what you believe. Right? So don't have 10 different businesses going on where you're really scattered right? Make sure you're present, just like with your family, right? If you've got kids, be present, give them attention. That's what they want. They want to be loved by you. And, and, uh, there's a song that I almost started singing right there. Um, but, but they really want to see you and hear you and know that you care about them. And if you're too, I was sharing out, it. If you saw me looking away, sorry, yeah. keep going. If you're too spread out, they're not going to feel it and they're going to leave, right? They're going to go find somebody that wants them there and gives them that attention. So make sure you're building that culture and, and culture is goofy because there's thousands, if not millions of different ways you can do culture, right? It's, it's like, what are the best traits you see in yourself and how do you find other people that believe those beliefs? You're not perfect, right? But what are the things that are most core to you that you're like, man, like this is the best part of me. And how Keep do you going, bro. I'm getting my note, my notepad. Keep going. Get it, get it. So like, how do you go find that in other people? Right? So, so right from the get go, I always think it's really important. It starts when you're writing the job ad. And I say job ad because it is not a job description. 
Nobody wants to come work for your job description. They don't care about, this is a Simon Sinek quote, they don't care about what they're going to do. They care about why they're going to do it, right? They don't care about how they're going to do it. They care about why they're going to do it. So when you're writing your job ad, and it's an ad because it's marketing, you're marketing to applicants and candidates. Recruiting is no different than marketing. The, the customer is a little bit different, right? But, but it's just another human. It's no different than your homeowner that you're trying to sell landscaping or window cleaning to. This is just a person you're trying to sell a job to. So it's a job ad and it needs to be an ad. It is marketing and it needs to be mostly about why they should come work for you. What are your core values? What's your culture? What's the, the money can be in there. And I suggest you should put something about like expectations and pay ranges because you don't want to, you don't want to pull the rug from them and make them think one thing. And then they find out something else. They're surely going to quit. If, if you don't set the proper expectations, just like customers will have a bad experience if you don't set proper expectations. Um, so you want to use that ad to set proper expectations, but you really want to make it about why they're going to love working for you. Right. And it's okay to say some of the funny stuff that's going to suck too, but why, 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 why? A little bit about how the day is going to go and what it's going to be like, but not a job description about you need to do this and you need to do that and don't do this and don't do that. And you're going to get fired if you do this. Dude, I saw a lawn care ad once. The guy said uh, something about, and don't think that you're just going to be on the ride and on the mower all day and not use the weed whip. Because he's in the a guy right in the ad, the owner, because I'm sick of that shit. Like, that's basically was like, <laughs> yeah, like who, who wants to go work for that guy? Like, he's already miserable. Why would you want to go work for somebody that's miserable? And so so it's like you, you got to attract the right type of for, for me. It's all about positive attitude. Like I can teach anybody to do what we want to do. How do I tell if they have a good attitude? Because the work that we do isn't rocket science. If they have a good attitude, I'm sure I can teach it to them. If they have a shitty attitude, I am sure that no matter how good they are at that task, I'm going to have to fire them at some point in time or they're just going to quit, right? So I'm usually, I, I try to steer away actually from hiring people with experience. They tend to come in with some sort of ego and overconfidence about what it is that they're going to be doing. I really look and try to weed out people that have a great attitude. Again, I can teach people to do what we do, but I've, I have tried to teach people to change their attitude. And I've put up with shitheads for way too long doing that and lost a lot of money doing it because as hard as they would try, a negative person just tends to be a negative person and I'm not a therapist. And so I spent a lot of my you know nights awake and, and my money trying to like help people that it wasn't my job to help. Um, so anyway, I digress. That job ad, it's got to be an ad, right? The goal is to get as many clicks as possible. It's not to use the job ad as a filtering system. Get as many clicks as you possibly can. Then get it into what's called an applicant tracking system. There's a whole bunch of them out there, some sort of scoring system. Um, when when we do this at Higher Lead Chill, we try to make it really fast. So there's some very like elaborate scoring systems out there. In our experience, those take way too long. If it takes five to 10 minutes for somebody to fill it out, it's probably too long, right? This is a speed game. You're going to, you're already going to get a bunch of no shows right there because they don't know you. They don't know you yet. They're not going to invest their time. It's your job to invest your time in them, not their job to invest in you yet. Eventually you'll need them to, but you're the one with the sale here. You're the one that needs them to be a buyer. They're not selling to you. You're selling to them. Again, you're marketing, you're selling. So make it fast, some sort of scoring system. We have a really simple one with like 10 questions. And, and it's just 10 questions that we have data on that says, is this person generally going to stay for a long time? Because if they're going to stay for a long time, it tends to mean that we like them and they like us, right? And so that's there's one underlying thing we just always need to get to is, are they going to last for a long time at our company? If the data suggests that, yes, let's go. Um, and then we get them into an interview and we try to make this process as fast as possible to go from they applied to get them to an interview. There's one thing that I see. No, there's not one thing. I've said that like four times already. So this is like another thing, another one of the one things that I see over and over again, people complaining about, which is, well, I had all these interviews set up and then I had all these no shows and then I hired all these people and, and they, they all no showed. And is that happening? Yep. You bet it's happening. And is it the problem of the candidate? Nope. It's your problem. It's your mirror that you need to go look into. 
if they sign up for an interview and don't show up, your job ad wasn't memorable enough or sexy enough to get them to actually show up to the interview. It was sexy enough to get their attention that they clicked on it. But remember, they apply to about 30 jobs in five seconds. It's a digital world, right? It's digital recruiting. If you have a job ad online, they are applying to your job ad and like 40 others at the click of a button. That doesn't make them a bad person. They just overcommit, which you and I would do too if we were out there. Be like, that sounds interesting. That sounds interesting. And you know this happens because half the people you talk to, if you reach out to them, they're like, who is this? What job is this for? They don't remember that they clicked on your job, right? And they're generally going to be more disorganized than you are, which is surprising because we're entrepreneurs. We're always a little bit scattered. Um, But they're generally going to be more disorganized. They didn't keep track of the 40 interviews they just signed up for and the time of all of them, right? So you need to be memorable. You need to be the one interview that they signed up for. We're like, I'm not missing that one. And that is based on your job ad and how you get them through a scoring system that makes them feel special, right? So you're selling. You need to make them feel unique. You need to make them feel special. You score them. You try to get them into an interview as fast as possible. Now, interviewing, and I'm going to spend most of my time talking about this because once you get them to this point, this is where you can really set yourself apart and make sure you're getting the best humans on the planet. We tend to go to default 1990, early 2000s interview style, which is we're going to come in and we're going to sit down. We're going to ask you situational questions, not yes or no questions. We're going to like ask you situational questions. Well, anybody that's interviewed ever knows exactly how to bullshit their way through all of those. And I know that because I'm a pretty good judge of human character, I'll say. But I freaking suck at interviewing. I just see the best in people. And so I'm like constantly trying to hire everybody because they tell me what I want to hear, right? Any question that I ask, they're generally going to tell me what I want to hear. They know how to play the game. In fact, I have hired people that interviewed so well and they were my worst employees ever. And I actually, and I've dumpster hired many a time. I hired people that interviewed like shit, but I just needed somebody, right? And they tended to be my best employees. Not tended to be, but but as often as anything else, they were some of my best employees. And it just told me like this interview of me versus you sitting down and me asking you those questions is not at all a useful filtering system. I might as well just hire them once they pass my little 10 question scoring thing. Because because I'm not better at weeding these people out after that point in time. Um, but that also isn't great because then I still am hiring a bunch of people that aren't a good fit. And the more people you hire that aren't a good fit, the more it erodes that culture you work so hard to build. So like you need to be a little bit picky. You don't just want to let anybody in the door because you're trying to get a bunch of A and B players on the team or, you know, A players, you'll have a few B players, but you really can't afford to have C players. And the more of those you let in, it's a sure bet you're going to lose your A players. Now you're stuck with a team full of B and C players and your C players are going to quit because that's what C players do. And 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 now you're kind of like short staffed and your B players get frustrated and they quit too. In the uh, book Top Grading by Brad Smart, he talks about how A players only want to work with A players. If there's a B player, what will happen is they'll pull that B player up to become an A player, or the B player will end, eventually quit. And if there's a C player, they won't player. last or they don't want to be there because the A players will literally push the C player out. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Or, or if you keep the C player, this happened to me. Cause I, I am like relentlessly seeing the best in people. I've lost my best employees because I kept some shitty ones. And then I'm like, well, that sucks. Like if I would have seen that coming, can I like hit the time travel button and go back and fire the one that should be out of here? And that I've been like trying to, you know, the person I'm trying to help through these attitude problems. Hey, they, a couple hunters just said, right. this is my dilemma right now. <laughs> and Lager's Lawn and Landscape said, Mr. Plata, I really enjoy hearing your input on the podcast. Keep rocking, bro. You're great. All right. Keep Man. going. So, right. so but just, I'm not saying all of you out there aren't good at interviewing. I sure hope to God you're better at it than I am. But again, it's just, it's almost impossible to really tell who's going to succeed and who's not going to succeed sitting one-on-one across the table. The if they're a good salesperson, they're going to sell you on them, even if they're shitty at the work that the, you're going to be assigning them to do. Maybe you should put them into sales, I guess. Um, so here's a thing that we found to get through this point. So again, goal is get as many applicants in the door, get as many clicks as you can, have a fun job ad, have something that's interesting about why people would want to come work for you, get all those clicks, then have a filtering system that lets people get into your, you know, world right 
and see a little bit under the hood, but it's fast. Like ideally by the time they click the button and get through that, it's, it's minutes, it's automated. It's easy for them to do boop, 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 boop. I mean, the minute they apply to your job on indeed, it's follow up, follow up, follow up, follow up, follow up. And they're signing up for an interview. That's super crucial. Now, Mm. when they sign up for the interview, this is what we have found to work the best. And, and I I know a couple other people that are doing this and everybody that's doing it, I haven't heard one person be like, nah, that doesn't work. Everybody that's doing it is like, dude, it changed everything. So if there's a secret sauce to what I'm talking about now uh, on this podcast, it's, it's coming right now in the next 20, 30 minutes here. When you bring them in for an interview, if you do one-on-one interviews, it is super time consuming. Right, you're setting aside like 30, 45 minutes for each single individual. And in this no-show culture, you already know half the people aren't going to show up. So now you're setting aside time where you might be out doing sales calls, but instead you're sitting in the office or you're paying somebody else to sit in the office for a person that's has a 50% or less chance of showing up. Like the no-show rate is real. Even even if you're doing everything right, you're still gonna have plenty of no-shows, right? You can improve that by doing things right, but you're still gonna have a lot of no-shows because they are clicking on 30 job ad job ads at once. And the no-shows don't go away because even when they do, you know, they they accept 20 interviews and they maybe go to five of them. Well, then they accept three of those jobs, right? They can only go to one of them, so they're gonna keep no-showing. You just want to make sure you're the one that they don't no-show to, right? At the end of the day. So Instead of trying to set up all these one-on-one-on-one interviews, which A, you're probably not good at, and B, take a shit ton of your time, and C, are really frustrating because you get so many no-shows and you you could have been home with your kids or out doing a sales call, or if you were me, you'd be out bow hunting and drinking a bush light or something, not at the same time, but at different times. Um, but, but you could do anything else, right? Instead, you're like sitting around waiting for this human that has a 50% chance of showing up. So what we started doing is we would set two interview time slots a week, three if you need it, one if you don't need as many, but just different interview time slots. And so you would send them, hey, here's the times that we're interviewing. Let me know which one works for you, right? And again, it's a speed game. The sooner you can go from they click the button to to this point, the better. If you wait a day, they're probably already gone. And and it's not that, again, they're they're probably not going to get back to you because they already took a job. Like people can have a job tomorrow right? It takes two seconds to go through this process. So uh, it's a speed game. It's a race. Um, when you invite them to that interview, you give them a couple time slots and you don't tell them what is about to be unfolded here. You just say, here's your interview time slot. Now you've got two time slots. There's going to be more than one person that shows up, right? You're going to send that. Here's the time slots out to 20, 30 people, hopefully assume half of them show up, you're going to have five to 10 people sitting in that room for an interview. And something pretty cool happens when they show up, which is just human nature is they start eyeballing each other. Like, oh man, like I showed up in my cargo shorts. That dude's wearing a suit. You know, I better, I better like sit up straight and look professional and ask good questions because he's already like looking like he's ready for this job. And I just thought I was coming in for a shitty little interview here. And so you create a competitive spirit, which is good because in general, we want our employees to have a little fire, right? We want them to have a competitive spirit. They're producers, they're technicians. They're going to be out there. We want them to like look at the scoreboard and see how we're doing. So we get a little gauge on their competitive spirit. And I think super importantly, back to kind of the theme of this whole thing is you are the salesperson. They are not there to convince you to hire them. You are there to convince them to come and work for you. They have all the leverage, right? We need them. They don't need us. They can go get any shitty job out there. We want them to have our shitty job. Damn it. Now our job's going to be awesome because you're going to work on culture. Uh, But they can go get any job. There's everybody's hiring, right? And so the job, the, 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 the role here is not that they need to impress you. It's that you need to impress them. This person sitting across from me, I was actually working on this with Sean from Hire Lead Chill today. We're going through the average revenue value of an employee per year. Lawn care, kind of 75 to 100,000. Window cleaning, kind of pushing 150,000. And bigger landscaping, 150 plus, depending on the size of projects you're doing. Pressure washing, like 200,000 a year in revenue. Um, Fleet washing, like 225. 
landscape lighting, 300 to 500,000 revenue per employee, per good employee that shows up every day. Those are what like, planet, what the fuck planet? Are, I, man, I dropped the F bomb. You got me triggered. What planet are you on? Dude, this is the, these are the average numbers from good producing employees. Like my window cleaners can go out and easily do $800 a day by themselves. Easily. My good ones do 1200 bucks a day. So now, now I don't expect everybody to do 1200 bucks a day, but that guy that I'm interviewing, I'm trying to find a dude that can do $800 a day of window and gutter cleaning. And if I can, he's well, that, that part makes sense. When you started getting into the multi hundred thousands, I was like, so, so what are you so, talking about? Like, it sounds sure. like a tech firm from Silicon sure. Valley. If this, if this dude's doing 800 bucks a day in production and there's 250 work days in a year, that's $200,000 of revenue. I even rounded down from that. It's 800 bucks this. a day, 800 bucks a day, 250 days is 200,000 bucks of revenue. That's my window cleaner and gutter cleaner, dude. Two guys or one guy? One guy. Yeah. One guy can do 800 bucks in a day. If you, okay, if you, how have, many if days? You 250 work days in a year. There's like 250. Oh, yeah, yeah. Let me see. How, how many months are in those 250? It's just 250 days in a year. There's 250 work days in a year. Take out holidays and weekends and vacation days. There's about 250 work oh, days. Oh, in a 365 yeah. day year. Because yeah. yeah. what are they going out in the freezing cold? In the middle it, of the winter, it's, it's, ge it, it's geographically dependent, right? So if you're you're if you're in our geography, that's why I said 150, right? It, I didn't put 200. If you're in Florida or Texas, you can go out all year, right? So so point being is the person across from you is generally worth hundreds of thousands of dollars. Mm. What client do you have that's worth a hundred thousand dollars or two hundred thousand dollars? Like probably for most of us, none. But that employee sitting across from you is worth that much revenue if you find the right one. This is the biggest sale you're ever going to make. And half the time, we treat them like they're sideshow garbage. We should be, like, freaking scrubbing their feet, man. They're so valuable. They're worth hundreds of thousands of dollars. And we're I feel like there's, like, an. It, this might just be going on in my brain, but I feel like there's an elephant in the room, and I have to just address it real quick. Hit it. If you're in the other podcast I've done with you talking about cash flow purgatory at different levels, like, you know, 305, 750, 1 million, all these cash flow purgatories given a fully legitimized above board, like hyper systematized business. And it's still going through cash flow purgatory where it's really hard to squeeze to the next level. And you got to keep expanding and reinvesting. And then the owner went from making good money to barely making anything for a little bit. He's, you talked about this on my latest yeah. podcast on Apple and Spotify. Look it up. Everybody here, you have to listen to this podcast with all that happening with the type of pricing you're talking about that these employees are generating, that means that 99% of everybody on this that's listening right now, probably inc including myself, is radically undercharging. To, I don't, dude, I don't that's that's fucking mind blowing to me, bro. That no, I could see it in like like high end tree trimming and like maybe fucking like if unless you have a hyper systematized business where you're like like your funnel's huge and you're qualifying the shit out of every customer and you're like like a surgeon's scalpel closing only the highest ticket jobs and they're like boom 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 just your schedule's packed with all yep. jackpot jobs all the time so and we're not it's not that we're under and i believe you you're the home service cfo you're fucking we're, dude you you guys do my bookkeeping and it's the shit is meticulous like i'm talking like you're a numbers guy down to the you know where every penny is in and out. And I believe you 100%. I'm just like, I want to have more conversations about this in the future. So, and I'm not trying to like, uh, yeah, what happens to podcast or something else, but I'm well, fired I up. This, this is a really good point, though. What happens isn't that we're undercharging, it's that we keep turning people over. Cause then, and so like one guy doesn't make 200,000 bucks, he makes us 30 and then he quits or we fire him. And then we go hire a new guy that makes another 40 or $50,000 and he doesn't stick, right? So the problem isn't that we're undercharging. We have 15 guys in our residential window cleaning business in Minnesota. On average, a, one of and we're we're shut down for four months out of the year. Like the couple guys that we have that stick around all year will produce. Like one guy will do 150, another guy will do like 130, right? We're shut down for four months out of the year. We don't do snow removal and stuff like that. The reason why we have 15 guys for a business that does a little over a million is because we have these ups and downs because we can't we, we haven't perfected the keeping everybody um and part of that was like 
historically I was always spread too thin this year, Andy who runs that business had two different businesses. And so he wasn't present and our office manager wasn't good enough to keep them. So we were like turning over employees and we were hiring crappy employees and it really matters. It pulls that revenue per employee way down. This revenue number is like, you need to go find the right person. Most time we don't. And most of the time we don't keep them because we're not doing this right. We're not finding the right person. I so, can see that having a player rock star employees that you're confident enough to just go out and crush it with the sales and marketing and work on the business because mm-hmm. you know these guys are producing and they have the right leadership, the right culture. It makes perfect sense. It's yeah. when the owner is keeps switching his hats and he's putting out fires and he's stressed out because the guy didn't show up on a Monday and you got a crazy pack schedule. Now you got to spend hours recalling all the customers because, yep. oh, boom, he's got a problem with this. And now this other employee didn't show up. So you're constantly playing this like musical chairs game. Yep. Um, Br- Brent on our team makes, yeah. I don't want to talk about people's wages, but I'll uh-huh. say he can push 50,000 pretty easily in wages. We pay, mm-hmm. we pay 23% commission. So the dude is doing 200,000 a year. I like this. My sprinkler techs bring in 1,500 to 2,000 per day. Heck yeah. Heck yeah. Nice, and, nice. And you, can't, you can't do it every single day, all day, right? It's like if you're a golfer, you can't hit every shot right next to the pin. Uh, but, but my point being is even if that window cleaner was worth $75,000 instead of one hundred and fifty, there's still the biggest sale you're going to make all year, right? That that person is still so, so, so valuable to your business from a numbers perspective, and we don't treat them that way. We drop everything for a client that we're doing a $2,000 job for, and we neglect an employee that makes us $100,000. It's stupid, right? We should be spending all of our time on these employees because if we go find the best employees, it's a hell of a lot easier to sell more $2,000 jobs. It's hard to confidently go sell two thousand, three thousand, four thousand, five thousand dollar clients if you're like behind the scenes, you're like, but my employees kind of suck and they're gonna be yep. because they're gonna get yeah. Yep. So so like the two thousand dollar client's not the valuable thing. The employee that can actually go do one hundred fifty thousand dollars of window cleaning is the impl- is the important. That's thing. the who, not how. Yeah, if you can go get the right who, the client's just gonna come. And they're going to stay because they're going to have a great experience. Yeah, because when when I have the right team, I'm comfortable taking on 50, 15 to twenty thousand dollars landscape jobs because yep. I'm I'm confident everything's going to go smooth. When mm-hmm. I don't have right guys, I want to keep the average jobs down below seventy five hundred because I don't want the yeah, stress. You don't want some. <laughs> All right, is the Southeast Soft Wash? Is that Cody from Southeast Soft? Is it? Uh, let me know if that's Cody. I have 12 employees. Average pay is $32 per hour. That's pretty damn good. Five weeks paid vacation. That's good. Health insurance. That's great. It took us a while to get here, but you have to charge your customers accordingly to have the margin to do it. 100%. And, correct. and if you're, if your $32 an hour employees are super productive, like they're way better than a $10 an hour, $10 per hour employee that's not productive and is screwing stuff up and causing you to lose customers, right? So it's like you you can afford to have employees that make a shitload of money. They just need to be the ones that make you one hundred and fifty to two hundred thousand dollars, not the guys that make you the forty thousand dollars and then quit because turnover is really expensive. Um. So so here's the deal. So I, I got right. caught off on the numbers here, but my my point is that person sitting across from you is probably the biggest sale you're going to make all year, mathematically. So treat it as such, right? You're the salesperson. You should have water, coffee. Maybe if I was coming in for an interview, you'd have a bush light for me. Um, snacks, whatever, right? Like make them feel so damned welcome that they rem- like they are. There's no way they're gonna forget your interview because again, they're gonna go do like five other interviews and they're probably gonna accept your job if you offer them one. If they already showed up at the interview, they're very likely to accept your job. But if you don't have the most memorable interview, they're gonna no show you. They're going to accept your job because that's the world we live in and people don't like confrontation. So they're going to definitely tell you yes. And then they're going to no show you and go take, or they're going to show up on day one and be like, oh, this guy's full of shit. I'm going to go take that other job that I accepted. Right. Cause they probably accept three or four jobs. So wine and dine them, right? You're, you're the salesperson. They're the guest, make them feel super welcome. And now through this interview process, here's how I do this. I got like 15 minutes to, to, to nail this thing. So this, this is going to blow your mind. When you start interviewing them, we ask zero questions. We ask them zero questions. We already know what we need to know from that, uh, from the little screening test that we do. 
we have a gauge of if they're going to be a good technician or a good salesperson or whatever it is. And the thing that we're actually looking for in this interview process is, do they want to come work for us? Are they going to love it here? And asking them questions, especially in a group setting, would be kind of weird anyway. But you're only going to get the answer they want you to get when you ask them a question. But non-verbally, they will tell you everything. So so I, some other people that do this, I know they actually put a plant in the room to watch everybody through the interview process, through the, through the sales process, to watch the non-verbals of people. If they're sitting back, arms crossed, leaned way back, not asking any questions, they're not going to love working for you right? Like they're just, they're just not interested. If they're sitting forward, nodding their head, right? Soaking it up, drinking the juice and agreeing and and like loving what you're throwing down, they're going to like working for you, right? They're giving you all the clues. So here's how we walk through this interview process and, and you can do it however you want it. Here's how we like to do it. Um, stories sell. This is a chance for you to tell stories. People are interested in your stories. And if they're not interested in your stories, fuck them. They're not going to want to work for you if they don't like your stories, right? So the first story we tell is the origin story. How did we get started, right? Why was this a thing that we came up with? How are we even here today? Why is this an important business? What's cool about it? So we tell the origin story and that just kind of gets people like, oh yeah, like, this this didn't this business didn't just happen by accident. It was blood, sweat, and tears and ups and downs. And so we take them a little bit on that ride. Then we start telling them about our culture and our core values. And it turns out each one of our core values has a story. There's usually a reason why. And if you don't have core values, come up with some damn core values. They're so valuable in hiring and firing people big time. So core values, um, and then having like a story behind each one. Cause there's a reason why you believe what you believe. And there's usually a funny ass story. Like we at blue skies, we had positive attitude was our number one core value. You just couldn't work for us if you sucked. And it didn't always, it wasn't always positive attitude, but we had Tony and you've probably, if you've ever heard me talk, you've probably heard me talk about Tony before. Um, I hope Tony's caught one of these podcasts. That'd be really funny if he had, um, but the dude, like he was one of the dudes where he just had a super negative attitude. I actually, we, we kind of like parted ways with him one year and then we brought him back the next year because I sucked at this. That was how bad I was at it. I actually brought back a dude that I knew was not a good fit, but we just were desperate. We needed technicians. I've done that. Right. Yeah. <laughs> then, like I said, I'm not, immune <laughs> like to this at all. I've made these mistakes over and over again. That's the only reason I feel comfortable talking about it. Um, but one day, I mean, Tony was relentlessly a whiner. He was good in the morning. He showed up like 20, 30 minutes early every day and would be super organized. So it was just like, man, when you saw that, you were like, all right, Tony's back. We got like, he's, he's cranking it out. But by noon, he was just the biggest diva. Every little thing that went wrong, which like we're driving out to people's houses to do jobs on unpredictable properties. Nothing is going to go perfect. Right. But everything that went wrong a little bit, it was like, he was like, he put this, put it in this chest of emotion and then at some point he would just snap and it damn near happened every day. He would just lose his mind about the smallest thing. He like, couldn't get over tiny little things. It was a psychological issue that he had is, is like maybe like a bipolar thing or something that we, we couldn't figure out what to do with. But literally one day his, his route had him going like across town. And I'm like, Tony, you like, you chose this job. You know, we don't get to choose where our clients live. Somebody's got to take that route today. It was you. Yep. You had the shitty route today. We all know it, especially now that you just complained about it for like four hours. We're, we're all well aware that you had a shitty route today. Brent, when he built the schedule, he was also aware of that. So tomorrow your jobs are literally across the freaking street from one another. So you, you literally can don't even have to park a second time, right? Across the damn street. The next day can't make this up. Tony finishes his first job. The minute he's about to start his second job, he's like, God damn it. I don't even have time in between these jobs to take a smoke break. That guy's standing on his porch looking over here like I'm doing something wrong because I'm not starting. Like he just went off about his job being right across the street. And I was like, I just don't like, how do you, what do you, what do you even do? Like, you're going to complain no matter what the hell the schedule is. Right. So, so that's our positive attitude story. And I would tell that story in an interview. Cause that's a funny ass story. And so I'd say like, Hey, if you're like Tony and you can't handle things going wrong, you just don't, you ain't going to love it here. 
And the whole point of telling these stories is I want to find people that are going to love it here that can bounce back and, and think the fun part of that is telling the story about it later, right? We've had naked people in houses. We've had masturbation stories. We've had naked old lady stories. We've had every kind of, st- like we're going into people's houses cleaning shit. We had maid service businesses too. So you get some really weird customers in there. Like, That's horrible. If you can't roll with all the stupid shit that happens in these businesses, don't come work here. Like stupid stuff's going to happen. It's usually the funny stuff we all tell stories about later. It's, uh, it's called type two fun. Um, but if, if it's going to ruin your day when something goes wrong, just don't come work here. Because if you can't have a positive attitude about, oh, you got to Mrs. Jones's house and then then her kid was sick, so she told you to not do the job, right? If that's going to absolutely ruin your day that now you got to wait for a little bit before you go to your next job, don't come work here. Because that's going to happen like by next week. It's just going to happen. It's the world we live in. So anyway, so we would go through each of the core values. We would tell stories about the core values. And again, when you're telling stories, people that are engaged in the story are like nodding their head. They're, they're agreeing with you, right? They're soaking it up. And if they're not, they don't want to come work for you. They are not interested in your business or your business model or your culture or whatever you have. And so as you go through the interview, that's really what you're looking for. We talk about pay structure. We talk about what a good day looks like. We talk about what a bad day looks like and some of the funny stories and, and just like, Hey, if you can't roll with these things, like you ain't going to love it here. Right. And we just, and we just keep trying to filter that out. We only want it. We only want you to apply for or to, to accept this job. If you're absolutely going to love it. If you don't, don't, don't try to work here, right? You're not going to, if you're not going to absolutely love working here and jump out of bed to come to this job, I do not want you to accept this job because you're going to be miserable. And if you are miserable, I'm going to be miserable. And that's a pretty shitty relationship. So let's not go down that path. We get into pay structure a little bit. So we pay commission style pay. And so we would talk about how that works and how this guy got paid for doing these jobs. And that guy got paid for doing those jobs. And then we really just kind of wrap it up with like, Hey, ask your questions, right? Let's field some questions. What questions do you guys have? And so that's kind of fun. You get a little competitive nature going again. And then we leave it open-ended. We say, Hey, like it's our job to make this a place you guys want to work. It's not your job to come and work here. The obligations on us. I tried to open everything I could open. I, I opened the hood. I opened all the doors. I opened the windows. Like mm. I think I, I showed you everything I can think to show you to, to help you decide if you're going to love it here. And if you're not sure, don't come work here. Only come and work here. If you're absolutely going to love it, I don't want you to take that chance. There's another job out there that's a better fit for you. If you're not quite sure if you're going to love it, if you are 100% absolutely positively sure that you're going to love it here, when you get out to your car, shoot us a text message. You know how to get a hold of us. Let us know that you're, that you're going to love it here. And then we'll work on a start date for you. But just assume you're, if you're already, if you're here, assume you're already hired, right? Now, if, if everybody says, Hey, I'm going to love it here. We probably can't hire all of you. Um, but, but like I said, unless you're absolutely 100% positively sure, don't, don't come work here, get out to your car, shoot us a note, let us know if you're interested in working here. And then we'll figure out the details after that. So we kind of, we don't put any pressure on it. We leave it open-ended, but that process has done a couple things. One is it sure as hell figures out who's going to love working for you. And I think anybody out there that's hired employees knows if an employee loves working for you, your life is so much easier. Your mm. life as a business owner, as a spouse, as a father or as a mother, whatever it is, like all the portions of your life, when you have employees that love working for you, that go out of their way to help you be successful, like that changes everything. And when you have employees that suck, it changes everything for the, for the worse. Right. And so, so if you can go find those employees that are going to love working for you, it means absolutely everything, absolutely everything. So that process for us has helped find that because the whole time we're just talking about, just like I just did for the last 20 minutes, like you need to love it here. You need to love it here. Only apply if you're going to love it here. Only, only accept the job if you're going to love it here. And so we work so hard to weed that out. So when they do accept the job, they're usually not going to no show because the people that accepted it accepted it because I told them a thousand times to only accept it. If they're going to love it here now have people slipped through the cracks and they sucked. Yep. Absolutely. But way, way, way better percentage of people that accept the job show up. Like the no show rate is way down. And the, that rate of like people we need to fire in the first week or two way down as well. 
because the only people that actually came now we have had people say, Hey, I'm in. And we've had to say, we actually don't think you're going to love it here. Like throughout that, throughout the process, we didn't think it was a great fit. We're going to pass for now, not to say you're never going to work here, but we have too many other people that are interested and we can't bring everybody on board. And we didn't get the sense from you that you're totally going to love it. Right. We've, we've had to say that before. What I think is really interesting back to the, when I, when I did uh one-on-one interviews, there were people that I really wanted and they would choose a different job because I couldn't convey, or maybe I conveyed what the reality was, which was I was super scattered and I couldn't give them enough time and they didn't want to come work for me. And like I said, I could tell they were good because they'd be the respectful people that would call to tell me they took a different job. And I was like, dang it, I knew they were going to be good. But when we do it this way in the group interview style and tell stories and we sell to them instead of having expectations of what they're going to do for us, the ones that we really want, we get like every time there's nobody that walks out of that room where we're like, we want that one and they don't come work for us. So if you can do that, if you can find people that are really going to love working for you and the ones you want, you get. And again, like part of it is just if I only have to do two hours of interviews a week instead of line up five to 10 hours of interviews to then have a bunch of people no show, like it saves me a whole lot of time to do the group interview thing. So it's time savings, it's quality, it's speed. It's just, it's all around. Like if you could do one thing and take one thing away from this, do the group interview exactly, like tweak it how you want to tweak it, right? It's your thing. You got to make it about your culture and your style. But damn. If, if we had been doing that when we had all these maid service businesses and so forth, it would have changed everything. It would have changed everything. I'm, I'm glad we didn't because I'm glad now I just get to focus on bookkeeping stuff and recruiting stuff. Uh, but man, it's uh, it's been night and day for us. And it makes, like I said, I mean, for, for selfishly, it makes the business a whole lot more fun to run too. Hey, Dan, before we wrap up here, can you go back for the people that joined uh, late, just summarize the key points? Like we talked about this, 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 and this, and how like, because you know, you're basically saying the small, the small hinges that swing big doors. It's just, yeah. It's so, so it. step one, when you're posting a job ad digitally, know that it's an ad. It's not a job description. It's got to be about your culture, your core values, why somebody would want to come work for you. It's good to talk about money in there because because just like when you're back in the Dayton scene and you're checking out the other the other uh, uh, I wanted to say opponents that probably was that way when, you were in the Dayton scene. when you're checking out the other folks out there that you're interested in like it's looks right let's not let's not kid ourselves when people are looking at your job ad they're looking at roughly how much money they're going to make but that will never keep them right just like looks can't keep you in a relationship your culture and your core values are what keep people. Your personality is what keeps you in a relationship. So God, I must have a good personality because my wife would totally divorce me with how much I hunt and fish this time of year. Holy smokes. Um, anyway, so so step one, write a really good job ad. Make it sexy. Make it fun. Right? It's an ad. It's not a description. Don't be boring. Be funny. Be goofy. Be attractive. Write a cool job ad. When you when you get those applicants coming in, you you cannot miss a beat. I mean, like the more you can automate it, the more you can get them from that they applied to interview scheduled. You need to do that at least within 24 hours. If you can't, here's my plug, hire us at uh, a higher lead chill. That's literally what we do is we get applicants to apply and we get them to your interview table as fast as freaking possible. Because if it takes longer than a day, they are already working somewhere else. Mm. They apply again, they apply to 40 jobs all at once. And so the no-shows aren't their fault. It's your fault. If they no-show you anywhere along that phase, it's because you weren't sexy enough. You got to be sexy, right? And this is taken from a guy that's not sexy at all, but I built a sexy recruiting process. Then when you get them to the interview table, instead of doing the goofy one-on-one interviews that are awkward and you can't tell if they're going to be good or bad anyway, set up group interviews. Invite. Don't tell them it's a group interview. Just two, here's our two interview time slots a week. Try to get... I'd say if you have like two or three people there, it's maybe not enough. Try to get four or five, six people in that interview room. It gives a little more, a little more competitive angle, a little more competitive spirit, a few more questions that are engaging, a little more conversational, and then just tell stories, right? And you don't have to be the best storyteller in the world, but the stories are yours. You don't have to make them up. It's your origin story. How did you get started in the business? It's your core values, your culture, the funny things that have happened to employees, the fun things, the scary things, the goofy things. 
and and get into pay structure, get into good days, get into bad days, all that stuff, and let them opt in. Again, it's the biggest sale you're going to make. It, you're, these the employees biggest sale you're going to make is the sale you make to that potential employee right in front of you. Yeah, they're they're worth a hundred thousand plus. Your, wow. your clients are rarely worth that much. So focus on getting good employees, and it'll be easy to get good clients. All right, I want to be respectful of your time. How can everybody find you? And what's up, Dan? Check us out. We have a we have a Facebook group, Hire Lead Chill. Go if you want more recruiting content and just to like be submersed in this. Go go join the Hire Lead Chill Facebook group. Um, I have my home service happy hour Facebook group and podcast. I think Sean actually has a podcast too for Hire Lead Chill specifically. So recruiting wise, go check that out. Um, I think if you go onto that group, you can. He's, his calendar link is out there too. So if you want to check out that Hire Lead Chill system. Go check that out. Sean does all the demos. He, I'm, I'm an owner in the business, but he's actually the operator of it. He's the dude that does all the things I just talked about. Um, and if you ever want to pick my brain, hit me up. Uh, just Facebook me, message me on Facebook. Follow me on the things on the on the gram under Home Service Happy Hour. Um, I'm always putting nerdy stuff out there. So wherever uh, wherever you can find me, hit hit the smash the like and subscribe button or whatever people. Say that too. <laughs> Thanks so much, Dan Plata, for being on my show here, the Untrapped Podcast. You can catch the replay just on any of my platforms at Keith Kelfis or go to Apple and Spotify within the next week or two. It'll be live and you can listen to it while you work. And thanks, everybody, for tuning in. And thanks a lot, Dan. I'll see you soon, bro. You know it. Later, man. Peace. Later.